Sharika Guyton, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you to Envision Christian Fellowship. We are so honored that you have chosen to join us here today for praise and worship. We hope that you enjoy your experience so much that it keeps you coming back Sunday after Sunday. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Michael A. Chambers so he can deliver the word for today. Thank you for tuning in on today. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with an opportunity to come together to worship him in spirit and truth. I'm grateful that you tune in, that you connected in on today as we share a word of, uh, of the Lord with you and ask that you walk along with us as well. So let us go to the Lord in prayer together. God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day. Master, most of all, we're thankful for your darling son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor and opportunity to come before you with thanksgiving and celebration in our heart. God, we're thankful that you look beyond our faults and see our needs on a daily basis. We're praying for this right now. Give us a word. We pray that you share that with us and through us. And we pray that you secure and sustain those who are viewing online. It's in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. 
Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with an opportunity to come together to worship him in spirit and truth. I'm grateful that you're part of this experience on the day. And we know that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we can ever ask, think, or dream. So if you have your Bibles, turn with us to uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 40. And we want to read a few of the following verses in your hearing. For the sake of brevity, we will read verses 1 through 5. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5. The scripture reads as follows. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet up on a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, a praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Verse number four, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor much as turn aside to lies. Many, O oh Lord, may God, my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5, for the sake of brevity, those are the scriptures that we're going to read in your hearing on the day. But I want to tag this text with this thought, and that is this. Um, and that is this, waiting in the pit. Waiting in the pit. Brothers and sisters, as we take a close look, if you will, look at back at verse number two, it says, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit. And I want to tag this text on a semantic spotlight with this thought that is waiting in the pit. It has been noted, brothers and sisters, that there's that there's a waiting uh, that may occur for a single person who is waiting on God to place someone in his or her life. Waiting in the pit. Then there's that. There's the waiting of a childless couple uh, who have desperately uh, wants to start a family. But uh, after days and after weeks and the prayers go unanswered, that couple is waiting in the pit. Or perhaps there's the one that's waiting on someone who longs to have a work that is meaningful and significant and seems to matter, but it just does not happen in the time frame in which they believe it should occur, waiting in the pit. Or perhaps it is that individual uh, who's waiting on a spouse, uh, the waiting of a spouse that's trapped in a hurting marriage that seems unable to change, waiting in the pit. Or perhaps that's the one that is find themselves in a traumatic situation or one who has gone through a period of suffering and loss. And they feel as though they have been trapped, traumatized, and literally terrorized by their own emotional upheaval, waiting in the pit. Brothers and sisters, waiting in that pit means simply this, that that pit uh, is one who has been paralyzed by problems. Those who are experiencing the mayhem of misery or who those who are overcome by the obstacles are surrounded by sorrow, one that is waiting in the pit of life. Brother and sister, it was Lewis Mead who said it best. He says, he says, waiting is our destiny as creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for. We wait in the darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait in fear for a happy ending that we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Waiting in the pit. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, as we look at this on today and look at this this morning, it's important and imperative for us to understand uh, that there is a way out of this pit, but it does require you and I to be in a posture of waiting. But I want to share with you, waiting is not what we may oftentimes think about or consider as we look at it through the lenses of David. David, it is believed that he's possibly up under physical duress. Some have said that he's in experiencing a moment of emotional distress. But whether it's duress or distress, David finds himself in the horrible 
pits of life. And here we look at it, very, brothers and sisters, as we look at it very closely, this waiting patiently. Listen to what he says in verse number one. I waited patiently for the Lord. As we look at it very closely, we know that David has it's been noteworthy to talk about that moment of waiting, whether it's the moment of waiting in Psalm 37 or it's the moment of waiting uh, that's thread through th uh, Psalm 37, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 34. Or perhaps even as we think about it, David has been instrumental and significant in sharing what waiting looks like for the individual, for the believer, for that person uh, who's waiting on the miraculous hand of God to show up in their lives. Waiting is a part of our lives. Waiting is a part of what happens and occurs oftentimes when we have not reached our ultimate destination or place of achievement, where we have ourselves in between uh, that uh, not yet and uh, potentially in our minds, not ever. And we are in the position in betwixt in between and using the word waiting. But I want to suggest today that waiting is not for naught. Uh, waiting is not a miss. Uh, waiting is not an exercise in futility, but rather waiting is a part and parcel of the believer's life. And you and I should have to be, should be in a place where we can begin to wait on God. Even Isaiah talks about those who wait upon him shall renew their strength. Brothers and sisters, waiting is a part of life. So the first thing I want to suggest to you that as we look at this way out of the pit, one is to understand this, that waiting on the Lord is intently active and not passive. Because as you look at this text, it is believed that in the Hebrew writings, that the word waiting means waiting and I waited. Uh, it is also said I waited and I waited for the Lord. It's not possibly human, a uh, human, a uh, uh, whole home type of waiting, but rather it is it is that kind of waiting where you pause and posture like we often do at a doctor's office when you thumb through the punch of magazines to pass the time away. But rather, it is an intentional moment of waiting, a place where we're actively engaged in waiting on the Lord. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's imperative for us to understand that as we look at it very closely, that waiting is a part of life. It's a part of what we do each and every day. But this particular waiting in which David is referring to is not just a haphazard type of waiting, but is waiting intently waiting actively and not passively. I do believe that it was G. Campbell Morgan who put it this way. He says that waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first activity, notice that word, activity under command. Uh, action, activity under command. Secondly, uh, Campbell says best, he says, that readiness for a for any new command that may come. Thirdly, it is the ability to do nothing until the main command is given. So I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, as we look at this very intently and intentionally, that waiting is a part of life. It is intently active and not passive. It means to wait with expectation, hope for God's promises to be fulfilled upon your behalf. The more intense your situation, the more intently you wait upon the Lord to fulfill his promises. And notice that David says in the very first verse, verse he says, I waited patiently on the Lord. Uh, active, uh, uh, under the activity, up under that time period, it is not a place of laziness, but it's a place of loyalty. It is not a place of being in a frenzy, but it's a place of being faithful. It's not in a place of being ex exhausted by the waiting, but it's a place where you are exploring what God has in store for you, our expectation of what God has on the horizon. So it is not a place where you do absolutely unequivocally nothing and posture and sit and sat calls and ashes and waiting on the move of God, but it is 
It is activity under the command of God. So brothers and sisters, waiting is uh, on the Lord is intently active and not passive, but also as it is here, uh, uh, waiting on the Lord means to cry out to him for deliverance. Listen to what he says. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. But it's one writer that says it best that it literally gives us a picture of God Almighty literally bending down symbolically, metaphorically, and lending his ear to the believer or that person who is crying out in despair, crying out in a moment of discouragement, crying out in a moment of, of, of a place of being in a dismal and abysmal place. But it literally says to us, it says, and he inclined to me, meaning that God gave a listening ear. It was not listening uh, passively. It was not listening with sympathy, but it was listening with empathy. What that meant literally means is that means that it is a picture. Uh, it is a picture of one, one scholar said it best that that listening with empathy or listening with a moment of empathy or seeing with empathy means this. It means that it's one who's at the top of a cave or a top of a hole. Sympathy says, uh, you, are you doing OK? Can I draw you out of that? I'll pray for you. I'll walk past you. That's sympathy, just watching and observing. But empathy is one who will take the steps down, take the stairs and go down into the pit and the hole and get close to you and not only feel your pain, but listen to your pain. And so literally, that's what God is doing. It's literally saying he's waiting on the Lord means to cry out to him for deliverance. It means that God has bowed down. God has lended is lending a listening ear. Don't ever think, you should never think that God is not listening, that God is not hearing and answering your prayers. Brothers and sisters, if I could pause parenthetically, if we remember that moment in time in which, in which that time in which Moses was down by the Reed Sea and God was talking to him and he was talking to God, God says to, uh, uh, why are you waiting here? Stretch forth your rod across the uh, Red Sea or the Reed Sea and cause it to part. He says, because God was listening with empathy. Uh, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that each time that you're going through something, each time that you're experiencing a moment in your life when you don't believe that anyone's listening, your neighbor's not listening, your family member's not listening, your friends are not listening, your spouse is not listening, the people around you are not listening, but God has a way of bowing or lending a listening ear to you when you're in the deepest and distressing moments of life. Know that, brothers and sisters, waiting means that we are waiting on the Lord with intently active and it's not passive, but waiting on the Lord means uh, means to cry out to him for deliverance. And listen to what he does. He cries out. He And understand this. When God is listening with empathy, uh, God's timing does not always coincide with our situation or our circumstances. Oh, oh we want it done instantly, but God has other purposes in mind. But whether you're in the pit or there's a sense of urgency, remember, he cries out, which means simply, Lord, help me in this situa situation. Lord, help me through it. Lord, help me out of it. Lord, help me up from it. Because this moment, this moment of despair, this moment of distress, this moment of duress has gotten the best of me. And I don't know what to do. But when you uh, when you echo when you articulate, when you communicate, remember that God is listening with empathy because he is lending a ear, even in the midst of your despair and your sorrow, God is hearing you. And we have to cry out for his deliverance. So here it is. Notice you see that in verse number one, but also you look at verse number 13. Listen to what the text says. It says here, but please, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord, make haste to help me. So he's telling God to get in a hurry because the, the situation is desperate. Get in a hurry because the moment is overwhelming. Get in a hurry because the things around me, I am drowning in this moment. But it is a uh, cry out to God because he understands that God is, uh, is leaning over and God is listening with empathy. Looking at verse number 17, listen what it says. But I'm a poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay. Oh, my God. This is David. 
This is the shepherd's boy. This is the musician. This is the one who slew the giant. And he says, God, get in a hurry. Because he understood that waiting on the Lord means to cry out to him for deliverance. And he knew that he could do that because God was leaning over to listen to him with empathy. Uh, but God was there to hear his moments of desperate plea and despair and cry. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, waiting in the pit means we have to wait on the Lord intently, being active and not passive. Waiting on the Lord means that we have to cry out to him for deliverance. Notice a couple of things that David does, if you will, in um, uh, Psalm 40. The first thing he, he says that he, he inclined to me and he heard my cry. And David goes in a posture and says in verse 13, make haste to help me. Verse 17, he says, Lord, help me and my deliverer. Do not delay. Oh, my God. This is David talking. He cries out for that moment of deliverance. And one reason oftentimes we don't cry out is because uh, to God, because is that we do not see ourselves as afflicted and needed. But when you're in a desperate and dismal and challenging situation, uh, we have to be at that place in space where we're crying out to God. Brothers and sisters, here it is. You remember the story of, of Peter walking on the water and Jesus coming across the water. And in the midst of that moment, in the midst of that time period, uh, Peter was in trouble. The waves were, were moving. The storms were, were roaring. The lightning was flashing. The water was splashing upon him. And he was drowning and he was sinking. But notice what, what Peter does. He said, Lord, save me. So whatever you do, never get out of a place or a posture or position where we fail to cry out to God. Because crying out to God, understand this, God will lean over and then God will listen with empathy. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, but not only that, as we think about that, waiting on the Lord means trusting him and trusting him alone. Listen at verse number three, if you will. The text says, he says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. He says, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear it and will trust in the Lord. Verse number four, it says, blessed is the man who makes the tr his trust, his trust in God do and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Because here it is. He's waiting on the Lord means trusting in him and him alone, because you got to understand that Satan, Satan is tricker, is, is a trickster. He has, he performs levels of trickery. Uh, he's, in, he's designed to, to, to draw your attention from the place and the space of God. The notice where he says, not for me to listen to the proud or to listen to the lies. You can get to that place where you're so proud that you fail to, to cry out to God, to fail to trust in God, and to be swooned or pulled in by the lies of Satan. But notice what happens. Waiting on the Lord means trusting in God and God alone. Don't trust so much in the things around you, the people around you, but it is important that you trust solely in God and God alone. Put all your eggs in that one basket. It will make a difference in your life. But notice what he does is in verse three, he expresses this hope that because of the testimony of waiting on the Lord also will come to trust him. In verse four, we see him, he mentions how blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. It literally means in one translation, it says in the best, it says, do not withhold your mercy from me. Lord, may your love and your, your truth always protect me. Brothers and sisters, here it is. So waiting on the Lord is not just a passive bidding of your time. It's an active crying out to the Lord, trusting him for the answer because of his love and his compassion. Because he has loved us unconditionally. He has loved us without hesitation and reservation. And therefore, he will love us so much so that he will have compassion upon us. Do you remember uh, that particular moment in time in New Testament where he saw the, uh, the individuals that were there upon the grassy areas and they were looking for food in need of food? And he, the Bible says that he fed 5,000 besides uh, 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 women and children, meaning literally that it was possibly anywhere between 15 to 25,000. And he took two fish and five barley loaves. Uh, and, and here it is. And he had, the Bible says, he had compassion upon them. You remember the story when the woman was coming out of the city 
and Jesus was coming up the way and he met this funeral procession in route. And the Bible says that he had compassion upon them and caused the resurrection and the res restoration of life of that son. So the point is, is that God is moved by his compassion. God will move with his love, even in those in those moments where we don't think he's there, when we can't feel him, we don't believe we can experience him. His love and his compassion will surround us and sustain us. Here it is. Waiting on the Lord means trusting him and trusting him alone. I like what the psalmist says. It says, he says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And notice what the second part, he says, and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Don't go to the opposite end of the spectrum when things are not working out in the way that you anticipate, the way that you want, in the timing that you want, not to turn away, turn toward things that you think that may resolve the issue quicker, that may handle the problem sooner, that may deal with your dilemma at the right moment in time that you desire. But he says, be careful how you shift and you turn to other stuff, to other things, to other people. But he says, put your trust solely in me. He says, I have brought you to this point and I will take you through this point. Here it is. Waiting on the Lord means trusting him and trusting him alone. But also waiting on the Lord means recounting his many wonders and providential care. Listen to what verse number five says. It's as though David goes back in time. It's as though he walks back through the footsteps of his life. He has that moment in time where he remembers what God, listen to what verse number five says. It says, many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Waiting on the Lord means recounting, rehearsing, uh, recalculating the number of blessings that God has bestowed upon your life. He tells them, you've got to redirect your mind to think about the right things and not the wrong things. If you're thinking, oh no, God has abandoned me, I'm doomed. You will either panic or turn to the world for help. But if you think about God's many wonders and how he has worked out things in the past and how he has delivered your people, his people and how he has delivered you, then you will recount the blessing. Matter of fact, you remember there's a, there's a story that's told. There's a hymnologist that said, uh, count your many blessings. And name them one by one. Brothers and sisters, we have so many blessings, so many places and moments in our time. The blessings and that place of gratitude can become the conduit or the challenge of the channel for your breakthrough, your blessing, and a place to lift your burden. He says, recount the blessings. Notice what he says here. Uh, Psalm 104 says the best. said, God established the earth and that, that is hospitable for us to live here. He placed the earth at the proper distance from the sun so that we are not burned or freeze. He waters the earth, providing crop for our food. This is how blessed we are. He preserves us from many catastrophes that we don't even know about. Brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand to recount the blessings, the many times that God has delivered us, has taken us out of that Egypt moment, has created a pathway toward our exodus, has gotten us through the valley of the shadow of death, have, has gotten us through many dangers, toils, and snares, yet we have already come waiting in the pit. In the final analysis, David says, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. He keeps right on blessing us over and over again. And so in the midst of our posture, of being in the waiting zone or in the waiting room or in waiting in the pit. Remember in the pit, there is a place where you can begin to look at what God has brought you from and what God has brought you through and what God has done on your behalf. Waiting in the pit. May God bless you. May God forever keep you is our prayer. Brothers and sisters, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, in the pardon of your sin, today's a good day to know him. Accept him as your personal Savior and Lord and make him the Lord of your life. 
It is possible to wait in the pit knowing that God will bring you out of that pit. Brothers and sisters, let us go to the Lord in prayer together. God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day, Master. Most of all, I'm thankful for your darling Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor to come before you with thanksgiving and celebration in our heart. We're praying for those who are out there uh, listening by some form, some form of technology. God, we're praying right now for them. Pray that you will strengthen them, that you will encourage them, that you will lift their spirit. Wherever they are in their life, God, we're praying that you will turn their situation around, move them to the next level, cause a shift to happen in their life. While they're still in the pit, we know that you can help to bring them out of the pit and put a new song in their mouth and place their feet on the solid ground. Praying for salvation, we're praying for restoration, praying for that one that's unsaved now that says, I admit, believe, and confess that you are the Savior and the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Praying for that other individual that may have disconnected or divorced themselves from you and they have a desire to, for you to reestablish yourself on the throne of their heart. We're praying, oh God, that you will renew, restore, and help them to move through the process of rededication. We ask that you bless them right now. Give them strength and give them the courage. It's in your darling son, Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with an opportunity to come together to just worship, to celebrate, to listen to the word of God, to take a few principles that will move you to the next level. I encourage you to go back and read Psalm 40 in its entirety and see if God won't bless you. Even when you're in the midst of the pit, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of circumstances and watch God work as you wait on God in the pit. May God bless you. May God forever keep you is our prayer. As always, walk with the King and be blessed. Thank you so much, Dr. Chambers, for delivering God's word to God's people. You can join us here on this platform every Sunday at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock a.m. or at 7 o'clock p.m. and that is Eastern Standard Time. So many people has asked the question, what does partnering with Envision Christian Fellowship consist of? It consists of daily prayers, weekly teaching and preaching, monthly encouragement from the ministry team. You also gain an authentic relationship with the ministry team. And if you desire additional pastoral services, they are available upon request. Other ways to partner? You can partner through praying with a team of committed ambassadors of Christ affiliated with Envision Christian Fellowship monthly. You can partner through serving with a team of committed ambassadors of Christ affiliated with Envision Christian Fellowship quarterly. You can partner through connecting with local, regional, and international nonprofits. And you can also partner through giving consistently to Envision Christian Fellowship. And you can give either weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And you can give through Cash App or PayPal. Thank you again so much for joining us today for Praise and Worship. We hope that you really did enjoy your experience. Next time, we would love for you to invite someone to join you. We hope that you all have a blessed day and stay safe. Bye for now.